Our expert panelist today is Dr. Hassan Sayyid. Uh, Dr. Sayyid is assistant professor and consultant neurosurgeon at University of Virginia with subspeciality focus in pediatric neurosurgery. His clinical interest includes brain and spinal tumors, epilepsy surgery, cranial cervical spinal disorders, Moya Moya disease, and minimally invasive brain and spinal surgeries. He has numerous achievements to his name, including a master's degree to investigate a cancer stem cell biology at King's College London. Uh, Dr. Sayyid, we are honored to have, to have your presence. Before we start, I would like to urge the trainees to participate. Uh, there's no harm in being wrong. The sessions, uh, these sessions are arranged for you. So I urge you to participate. Dr. Mohammad Rafi, can you start please? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, can you uh, see the slides? Uh, yes, uh, Rafi, you can see the slides okay. and you're audible so as well. Okay, so we'll be starting our uh, today's session as we have uh, discussed in previous session in detail the anatomy of the occipital and the parietal lobe and now we are discussing the basic and the common approaches for the lesion in the parietal and the occipital lobe. So uh, before starting, we will quickly go through the these general anatomical features. As we all know, uh, the fissure and the sulci, these are the natural extension of the uh, uh, subarachnoid space and they delimit the gyri on the brain surface. So uh, these ana basic anatomical features, they basically uh, provide you the corridor to approach any lesion within, uh, within a brain. So the depth of uh, these sulci may range from one to three centimeter and in between uh, two gyri there is a sulcus and within the sulcus there is a transverse opposing gyri. As we all know, it can be short, long, continuous, or interrupted. So if we are using this sulci for approaching our uh, area of pathology, we will be using a trans-sulcal approach or the trans-sulcal corridor. <clears throat> and if we dissect through the brain tissue or the gyri, we will be using the uh, trans-gyral approach. And if we open the fissure, any fissure and uh, to reach the area of interest, we will be using the transfissural approach. And if we uh, open a cistern, uh, we will be using a transcisternal. If you're going through the cistern, we will be using the transcisternal approach. <coughs> so for this, uh, we have considered the salsa as a basic anatomical landmark. <coughs> as you all uh, can see, this is the pathological specimen of the brain. Please avoid the white lines. Here, these are the gyri on the surface of the brain. The, these are the two gyri and between the gyri, you can see a sulcus. This is the sulci. So it is one to three centimeter deep. And if you are use, going through this sulcus to approach your lesion, you will be using a trans-sulcal approach. Here you can see a transverse gyri that is connecting the two uh, gyri within the sulci. So if you are using this gyri or dissecting through this tissue, you will be using a transgyral approach. And inferiorly, you can see there is a sylvan fissure. And if you open it and you dissect through it to reach the area of the interest, you will be using a transfissural approach. So uh, some basic thing about the parietal craniotomy. Uh, this parietal craniotomy is basically designed to provide an exposure to the middle part of the brain that is the parietal lobe and sparing the anterior and the posterior part that is uh, that contains the important eloquent area. And this approach can be devised to the lateral and the mesial parietal lobe lesion, as well as to interhemispheric median or paramedial lesion. So in this area, <clears throat> a good thing is that, that we have a very few uh, parasagittal veins. So we have an opportunity to reach the deep uh, lesions through this approach and uh, without damaging these vascular structure. So indication, as you all know, uh, any extra ex axial and intraaxial lesion, most common are the neoplasms like meningioma, parasagittal meningioma, uh, felsines of felsine meningioma, gliomas and uh, metastasis or any uh, arteriovenous malformation of cavernous malformation. So for the parietal interhemispheric corridor, 
it is basically used to approach the parafel sign medial parietal and the splenial regions so starting with the position the patient uh, position can be either three quarter prone or it can be a supine in three quarter prone position the as you can see the neck is in line with the body so you do not have to excessively rotate or bend the neck and you can avoid any excessive pressure from the neck muscles you fix the head with the mayfield retractor and you it is preferable to keep the site of the pathology on the dependent area so that gravity may assist you in the retraction of the lobe you put an adhesive tape or a belt in the shoulder that is above and you retract it posteriorly so creating a room here so that you can adjust your microscope easily while doing the dissection then you apply to adhesive tape one at the anterior superior iliac spine second at the mid calf or the shin uh, to secure the patient you extend the inferior leg and you slightly flex the superior one and place a pillow in between and secure all pressure points it is important to place a gel pad in the shoulder at uh, the axilla that is below uh, to in order to avoid the <coughs> brachial plexus injury same for the supine position the patient is lying uh, uh, supine and we secure it by using the belt one at anterior superior iliac spine second just above the knee or <coughs> at the level of shin we uh, secure the patient uh, head with a mayfield clamp and we slightly flex it so this is for the supine position the flexion of the neck as you can see depend upon the location of the tumor if it is located slight posteriorly you can always slightly flex it more or if it is located slight laterally you can turn it onto the contralateral side same uh, for the uh, three quarter prone position uh, the uh, try to uh, keep the dependent uh, the involved lobe on the dependent side so the gravity may assist you while retraction of the lobe and uh, usually a horse shoe shape incision is given the length and the width of the incision depends upon the size and the site of the tumor which we calculate pre operatively by using the scan or by using neuro navigation we can also use a linear incision but uh, you have to keep in mind that you should cross the midline you should uh, cross uh, Uh, across one to two centimeter of your uh, skin marking on the opposite side, and then you make a inverted U shape incision. The same thing here. Here you can see this is a, a large uh, inverted U shape incision for a large parietal parasagittal meningioma. <clears throat> so once you have done with the skin incision, and if, if, if once you raise the skin flap. Uh, you will uh, do the craniotomy for craniotomy you do make two bar holes just above the superior sagittal sinus but note here the most of the surgeon they prefer to make it slight laterally on the contralateral side two bar hole here and two on laterally on the ipsilateral side and we do the craniotomy of this side these three side first and then we deal with the side which is just uh, <coughs> parallel to the <coughs> superior sagittal sinus in the end so uh, we do the craniotomy of this side in the end because if we damage the uh, venous sinus we can always quickly complete it and then we deal with the bleeding so before doing the craniotomy in this region uh, what we have to do we have to take a pen feel dissector or a watson chain and we separate the dura from the overlying bone in this region the dura is firmly adhered to the overlying bone so we try to separate it in order to uh, keep the sinus safe so if the dura is very firmly adhered to the overlying bone uh, we can always make a third bar hole here and we try to separate it from here so uh, also you have to keep in mind the position of the a uh, superior sagittal sinus it is a uh, somewhat slightly deviated towards the right side about 5 mm and the above range is up to 11 mm but if you have a lesion on the opposite side it may further pushes the sinus to the contralateral side so you have to anticipate it preoperatively or you have to 
calculate it on the preoperative scan or while using the neuro navigation so once you are done with the craniotomy <coughs> uh, you see a dura you start your duraotomy by using a 15 number blade and then replace it with the dural scissor and you make a c shape you make a c shape flap the base of the flap is towards the superior sagittal sinus and you can always turn your incision parallel to the sinus in order to increase your exposure so once you have done that you elevate the dura and you can see there are some bridging veins that are connecting the dural flap and the superficial cortical vessels so you have to respect these vessels and you do not try to <coughs> coagulate them and damage them the second thing is that there sometimes there is a firm adhesion between the some arachnoid adhesion between the dura and the these cortical vessels so you have to sharply dissect it but again keeping in mind not to damage any venous structure here so once you have done this you retract the dura by using the stay suture and then you have the, you will be uh, seeing this view if your pathology is here in the paramedian region region you can start your dissection directly from here <coughs> or if it is here in the interhemispheric or falcine or subfalcine region you slightly retract the medial part of the parietal lobe and you start dissecting your lesions here sometimes uh, your tumor is involving the fox and it is going on to the opposite side so in order to open this fox and uh, in order to dissect the tumor from the opposite side you can give a t shape shape incision and you can approach the medial part of the contralateral parietal lobe uh, from the uh, from this side if you go deep here you can also enter the atrium of the contralateral left uh, contralateral ventricle so once you have done this uh, you start your dissection with the bipolar cautery or the cusa cusa and you uh, remove the tumor so what happens if uh, there is a superior sagittal sinus involvement by the tumor for this as we all know especially for the meningiomas we have a classification system this is called the sendo classification and in which we have six grade depending on how much tumor is involving the sinus and for this we have a simpson grading system for the dissection Uh, of the tumor it has a five grade and it tells you the uh, extent of the dissection and the rate of recurrence so uh, if your tumor is involving the sinus if it is attaching to the sinus and in uh, just abutting the sinus you can always completely remove it with the marginal debulking and if there is any tear you can always repair it while if the uh, tumor is involving the sinus you can open the sinus and completely remove it or either you can leave the tumor in situ but obviously it is associated with the higher rate of recurrence then so important point to remember in the parietal craniotomy is the position and keeping the site of pathology on the dependent side to allow the gravity to help you in retraction you have to uh, uh, see, you have to prevent the injury of the venous structure that is the superior sagittal sinus and the bridging veins because it may lead to the uh, venous edema and uh, sometimes the venous infarctions so uh, uh, we'll uh, briefly talk about the dural venous sinus injury what happens if you damage the dural venous sinus while doing the craniotomy if you experience a bleeding from the site of the sinus uh, you quickly complete your craniotomy and then you deal with the bleeding <coughs> but sometimes if the your craniotomy is short and if there is a ledge of a bone over the superior sagittal sinus you have to remove it by drilling and then you deal with the <coughs> bleeding uh, the common uh, maneuver to stop the bleeding is you apply gentle pressure by using the cotonoid or the gel form and uh, in majority of the cases the bleeding will stop itself by using this but sometimes you have to go for a primary repair but it is associated with the higher rate of uh, Uh, venous sinus thrombosis so dural flap may be considered as a, a favorable option for this <clears throat> or you can use a fibrin glue or sealant or artificial dura uh, for uh, to stop the bleeding or to repair the sinus
so as we can see if uh, while doing the dichotomy these are the two sites these are the two common sites from where you can uh, have your bleeding and uh, because these sites are they they are close to the superior sagittal sinus and we have a venous lakes there so we can easily damage this and these are the common site for the bleeding <laughs> Uh, so uh, again, if we experience bleeding from here, we put a cotinoid or gel form, or sometimes we can use a small muscle graft to stop the bleeding. <coughs> so what happens if the uh, laceration or the tear in the sinus is too long? If you are working on the anterior one third of the sinus, obviously you can tie it without without uh, causing any catastrophic effect. But uh, while you are working on the posterior two third of the sinus, you cannot tie the sinus, so you have to uh, repair it or you have to do a dural flap. The uh, in order to make a dural flap, you have to put a cotinoid over the uh, tear and you cut the adjacent dura. in the rectangle shape and you make a swing flap over it like this while so creating a roof for the superior sagittal sinus as you can see here you cut the dura that is adjacent to it and you make a swing flap and stitch it to the dura on the opposite side while creating the roof of the superior sagittal sinus <coughs> so what happens uh, when you damage the trochlea while doing the occipital canotomy and uh, if the laceration in the trochlea is small you can <coughs> put a sponge stone apply gentle gentle pressure and uh, you will uh, uh, the bleeding will stop by itself uh, if the laceration is a little larger you put a graft and you stitch it with the surrounding dura but if the laceration is very large involving the superior sagittal sinus and the transverse sinus also you have to take a muscle graft or a facial graft and you put it <coughs> over the area of laceration and you first stitch the three side of this graft and leave the one side free before stitching this last free side you take your suction and you remove the clot from the sinus in order to maintain the patency of the sinus and then you stitch the remaining side of the uh, <coughs> graft so this is all about the parietal basic about the parietal canotomy now moving on to the occipital canotomy uh, as we know this occipital canotomy is designed to achieve an exposure to the occipital lobe the tentorium posterior incisural space splenium of the corpus callosum medial posterior temporal lobe posterior thalamus atrium of the ventricle and parieto occipital area this uh, and uh, this approach is very versatile if it is, if you combine it with certain corridors you will achieve the uh, you will approach different areas like if uh, you combine this occipital craniotomy with the interhemispheric corridor you can approach the paraphalcine medial occipital falco tentorial or the splenic you combine it with the trans tentorial corridor uh, you uh, you can approach the pineal region the precentral cerebral fissure and the posterior incisural spaces and if you combine it is infra occipital uh, infra occipital or uh, supra cerebral approach you can approach the mid, uh, pineal region <coughs> and the medial posterior temporal lobe lesions like tumor of the posterior hippocampus <coughs> so uh, the indication is uh, same as we know the any axial and uh, intraaxial or the extraaxial uh, lesion including the neoplasm like meningioma glioma metastasis or any vascular lesions now for the interhemispheric uh, corridor <coughs> of the occipital canotomy we make a three quarter prone position as you can see we fix the head with the mayfield clamp and slightly flex it the one place a pillow on the arm which is below in order to prevent the sling give a horseshoe shape incision here or a linear incision as shown here again the 
length and the width of the incision depends upon the size and the site of the tumor if the tumor is small you can always give a small incision if it is large you can give a large incision so it's a, a, generally you start your incision at the superior nacal line and you goes upward around the tumor and you have to be 1 to 2 cm on the contralateral side of uh, contralateral side in order to uh, gain the uh, better view or better exposure so uh, so you can also uh, uh, do it from the linear incision if the size of the tumor is small or if it is present on the surface here you can see a linear incision for the occipital craniotomy so why after uh, raising the skin flap or after giving an incision we do the craniotomy with the same fashion as we have discussed in the parietal thing to bur holes one just above the trochula and one above superior sagittal sinus but note here again some uh, most of the surgeon they prefer to make it on the contralateral side in order to minimize the risk of the injury to these important venous structures <clears throat> make two bur hole here again do these three side first and deal with this side in the end so uh, if you uh, if you can if you damage the sinus you can always quickly remove the bone flap and then secure the bleeding so once you uh, uh, elevate the dura you uh, in the c you open the dura in the c shape fashion and the base is always sinus you can see a very few bridging veins here and uh, the addition between the dura and the superficial cortical vessel they are usually flimsy in this region so <clears throat> if your pathology or if your tumor is in this region that is the uh, paramedian you can start the section from here by using the uh, cauti or the cusa but if it is in the region of the felcine so parafelcine or the subfelcine region you slightly retract the uh, occipital loop and you start the section your dissecting your tumor uh, from here <coughs> so uh, while <coughs> sorry while doing the uh, retraction keep in mind you do not put an static uh, retraction here by using the lela or the uh, uh, dura arm retractor uh, instead you, uh, you 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 put a you you do a dynamic retraction uh, with the help of your section and the uh, cautery because if you are working on the dominant side especially here at the occipital pole you may, you have a visual area so if you put a, a static retraction for a longer duration of the time you uh, there is a chance that you may damage this area <coughs> so uh, after uh, if if your tumor is lying post just deep to the deep to this area that is in the region of the splenium or the pineal region or the cortigeminal region you retract this area and you go deep this is the transclosal approach if you go deep from this area this approach is called the transclosal approach and you will find a white thin structure that is the corpus callosum and uh, you can see the two uh, pericolosal artery that is running over the uh, corpus callosum and you find a space in between these artery and you give a longitudinal 1 to 2 cm incision so uh, for the especially for the occipital and parietal craniotomy uh, uh, for, especially for the occipital craniotomy you will be working on the posterior part of the <coughs> corpus callosum that is the splenium and uh, usually 1 to 2 cm for incision they will not cause any uh, deficit post operatively so you give an incision here and you retract it and you will find the tumor in the area and you start dissecting it from here so if you combine the occipital approach with the infratentorial and the suprasorbital corridor uh, it is used to Uh, approach the tumor of the pineal uh, region and uh, which is present in the midline and you this approach is uh, uh, ventral to the important venous structure that is deep uh, present uh, deep to the uh, region of the pineal tumor like here we can see this is the sagittal view of the uh, brain this is the third ventricular cavity the here we have a pineal gland 
if you are approaching your lesion from here the majority of the deep venous structure either are on uh, present on the ventral side or superior to it so there is a less chance for damaging these important venous structure like same uh, in the same diagram here you can see either these venous structure are superior to it are ventral or superior to it and if you are approaching it from here there is a less chances to damage this structure here you can see a pre central vein which is draining into the vein of the galen and you have to sacrifice this vein while before entering this lesion so for this supra cerebral infratentorial approach this is a naturally occurring corridor so you do not have to dissect or violate any of the uh, normal tissue uh, while uh, going through this approach you just have to do a arachnoid dissection and you will enter in a natural corridor and you will go straight up to this your area of interest so for the position of this approach you can either do a sitting position or later or a prone position uh, in the sitting position as you can see the surgeon hands they are in vertical orientation so there is a chance of fatigue to the surgeon and there is a high chances of the air embolism as we all know but if you are working in the uh, lateral or the <coughs> prone position the surgeon hand is in the horizontal plane so there is so eliminating the factor of fatigue and there is a negligible chance of air embolism as you can see how you make a, a sitting position you have to flex the patient neck as much as you can in order to gain a good exposure to the area so if you are working on the uh, with the prone position you will have a difficulty while adjusting the microscope because of the steep angle of the tentorium so after giving an incision usually we give a linear incision in this area and we make two bar hole on either side of the midline and we do the inferior craniotomy first and then we drill the superior ledge of the bone up to the level of the transfer sinus which is the superior limit of our craniotomy then we uh, do the deraniotomy we start it from the lateral side and take it uh, medially towards the midline and here uh, we have the occipital sinus and we can always tie it coagulate or we can clip it so after doing this we raise a dural flap and we see uh, bridging vessels between the cerebral and surface and the uh, vermis going up to the dura and we coagulate it and we place a retractor and slightly uh, retract the cerebellum so once you retract it you see a natural corridor you start uh, your dissection and uh, you go deep after adjusting the microscope you see this view this is the uh, pineal region here we have posteriorly you can see this is the thickened dura because of the uh, underlying tumor and in front we have a pre central vein that is draining superiorly into the vein of galen so in order to gain access to this area you have to sacrifice this vein so once you uh, done this you open the arachnoid and you see the tumor you start the internal intracapsular debulking of the tumor and then you slightly peel the capsule uh, carefully from the adjacent structure in uh, in this manner you Uh, done with your infratentorial and sup, uh, supracerebellar approach for uh, now if you combine this occipital transtentorial approach to uh, if you combine this occipital craniotomy to the transtentorial approach which is basically uh, used to get the exposure to the cortigermal plate tumor and the tumor of the pineal region with the inferior extension so again we uh, do here the Uh, inverted u shape incision we started from uh, the superior nacal line goes around 6 cm above uh, the incision should be on the contralateral side of the midline and you go laterally up to the lambdoid and inferiorly up to the asterion you make the craniotomy in the same fas fashion as we have discussed uh, but you can always make these bar hole on the contralateral side in order to avoid the injury to these important venous structures so once you have done with the craniotomy and you open the dura you slightly retract the occipital lobe and you see the fox here and if you follow the fox inferiorly and deep 
it will you will find the junction of the fox and the tentorium like shown in this figure on the left so at the junction of the tentorium and the fox there is a sinus a straight sinus that is running and you give an incision parallel to this sinus in order to gain an exposure to the area of interest sometime you have to cut uh, this fox along the inferior sagittal sinus the anterior and end of it so in order to improve the exposure so once you done that you will see the uh, tumor and you will have a different corridors to remove the tumor in between the venous spaces or parallel parallel to this so you do a in a capsular a piecemeal debulking of the tumor and then uh, later on you gently remove the capsule peel off the capsule from the surrounding structure in this way uh, you done with the uh, transdentorial approach of the for the occipital craniotomy so uh, these are the some uh, basic approaches uh, for common uh, lesions that is uh, that are being approached from the parietal and the occipital craniotomy combined with different corridors so moving on to the radiograph this session is basically for the resident and uh, we'll ask question and resident can uh, answer it uh, while typing your message into the chat box dr sad are you there yes dr rafa up there uh, uh, may uh, i so go this uh, this is the sagittal section of an mri contrast as we can clearly see a lesion within the pineal uh, uh, pineal region so i would like to ask from resident which approaches can be used to approach this lesion so uh, you guys can use the chat box and uh, all the approaches that dr rafi has mentioned what do you think which approach which which are the approaches that we can use uh, to tackle this lesion so uh, dr priyanka is saying suprasarebral infratentorial approach anything other than infratentorial suprasarebral approach that you can use i think uh, major uh, the majority are are with uh, suprasarebral infratentorial approach why not why not a posterior transcolosal approach Dr. Fawaz is saying transdentorial approach. Uh, uh, we can uh, we can use transdentorial approach because if we can see the tumor has a slight inferior extension, so uh, we uh, yes we can go through this transdentorial approach also. But so, I I think it so, will be difficult. So what consideration do you take uh, when you look at a lesion like this while uh, you're thinking about suprasarebral infratentorial approach what are the things that you look at in a in a scan one one thing that you mention is the uh, steepness of the tent so can yes. you show the tent here yes here as you can see this is the tentorium so uh, so if there's a high riding tent so it will be a little uh, it can always cause a little difficulty because you have to you know follow that tent and once you have uh, so uh, so when you start the surgery your angle is somewhere uh, uh, towards the tent on the upper side and once you reach the tumor your trajectory change so you always it's always yes. important to see the height of the tent and uh, dr uzair is saying you have to see the venous anatomy as well you have to see where are the veins located are uh, will they will they be in uh, in your way so um, so we have a, a lot of answers Uh, most people are with uh, a suprasarebral infratentorial approach some are saying occipital transdentorial approach what do you think dr rafe um uh, yes uh, as we have mentioned this approach will be uh, can be done but it will be difficult to remove the uh, or the whole tumor from this, this approach so dr uh, uzair is saying can you explain uh, with regards to vein of gallen uh How, what are the consideration uh you, basically it is not visible in this scan but as i have shown it uh, previous in the previous slides the it is usually present superior somewhat here okay so so, so uh, when you yes go ahead uh, so uh, we do not have uh, the other cuts for the scan otherwise uh, i will show The, uh, this venous and add me to them can you go on to the image that where you showed the uh, venous and anatomy 
while explaining the suprasebral infratentorial approach uh, here we have this okay so uh, uh so, so can, yeah as you can see this uh, superiorly and, and anterior to it we have a internal cerebellar vein which is present in the roof of the third ventricle within the fold of the dura that is the velum interpositum uh, fold of the arachnoid sorry which is the velum interpositum and which drains here into the vein of gallen which is lies just posterior and superior to the pineal region so, so if we are uh, looking from here uh, there is a uh, like uh, less chances so the, uh, we damage these important venous structures so uh, the answer to your question dr zair is we always look at the venous anatomy while we are planning a suprasebral infratentorial approach to see uh, how difficult it is because uh, it will be uh, it, it, it can always cause you trouble for those who are who are saying transcolosal approach Uh, the tumor has to involve the corpus callosum, the splenium of the corpus callosum. If you want to do a transcolosal approach, if you, if it's not involving the callosum, then uh, you better uh, it's better to do another approach. And as Dr. Yeah. Rafis said, that uh, it's in, it is extending inferiorly as well, so you can do a trans uh, temporal approach as well. Dr. Hassan Syed, sir, will you like to uh, give your uh, expert opinion about the approaches? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Akhtar, for for the introduction, and uh, Dr. Rafai. Uh, you know, it's a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, also, Dr. Shri for for uh, for organizing this. Um, I have a couple slides as well for for a case that I can share. But just to answer your question, I think um, uh, you know it's important in terms of the uh, venous anatomy uh, to study that prior to uh, undertaking a, a specific approach. Um, all the approaches you mentioned, you know, are possible. There, there are difficulties with the uh, uh, supracerebral and frontal, as you mentioned, because of the steep angle of of, of the tent. Personally, I've done uh, pineal tumor surgeries um, using the uh, uh, inner hemispheric transcolosal approach. I think that 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 could be done in this case as well. And I'll show you a sort of a similar case that I I did uh, recently as well. Um, but um, um, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. But but um, you when you, when you do think about the, these approaches, you have to weigh the risks of the approach as well, um, and, and so that's that will help you determine what the best approach is. Uh, thank you, Doctor Hassan uh, Sayed. Doctor Rafiq, can you move on to the next scan? Yes, uh, uh, Doctor Saad. Uh, Doctor Hassan has some cases to show us, the, but quickly. i'll uh, ask just one last question from the residents then we'll uh, move to the dr hasan he will show us some uh, beautiful cases okay. so uh, i i will ask the resident which location is this which type of uh, tumor is this and which location is this so uh, do you think this is an extra axial lesion or intra axial lesion and which location is this uh, what sort of a lesion does this look like i would uh, like the uh, participants to use the chat box uh, it's it's okay to make mistakes you can write anything uh, we won't judge you so uh, what what uh, they'll which... write anything if you ask them to write anything they will write anything <laughs> <laughs> so what what do you think uh, what kind of a tumor is this do you think this is an extra axial lesion or intra so you uh, dr fifa all of, all of them think it's an extra axial lesion so uh, what sort of an extra axial lesion is this it's a meningioma so dr oswin is saying it's a parasagittal mem uh, meningioma while uh, dr memuna is saying is uh, this is a parafalsine meningioma so um, uh, one one important thing dr sad i would like to mention here uh, can anyone tell us the difference between the para uh, sagittal or the parafalsine meningioma what is the basic difference in between those so guys what between. what do you think is the difference between how do you differentiate a parasagittal meningioma from a falsine a uh, subfalsine meningioma what do you look at sign of parafalsine meningioma parafalsine yeah come on it's okay to make mistakes you can write whatever you think uh, how do you differentiate a parasagittal meningioma from a falsine parafalsine subfalsine meningioma anyone
I think they're all thinking about it. I think Dr. Rafi, you'll have to take the lead here. Okay. Uh, so, Can anyone so tell? Dr. So Dr. Fifa has answered that uh, parasitical uh, meningioma has an attachment to superior cervical sinus. Uh, Dr. Ariba is saying there's a presence of cortex in between the tumor and the fox in parasitical meningioma. Dr. Oxman also thinks that parasitical meningioma is attached to the uh, superior cervical sinus, while I think he's uh, he thinks that the falcine meningioma is not. So, Dr. So, Rafi. Dr. Saad, uh, this is the parafalcine meningioma mm -hmm. and uh, it, it is it is always also attached to the uh, superior sagittal sinus. But the basic difference in between the parafalcine and the parasagittal is it is always covered with the rim of tissue ar around it. The cortex is usually covering the uh, meningioma around it. As you can see, there is a thin layer of the cortex that is separating it from the FAX. And here in this parasagittal region, it is attached to the sinus. So this is the basic difference as someone has told, it is always covered with the rim of the cortex. And with the, in a falcine, falcine meningioma, you think it is you attached to the fox. Fox. So there will, no cortex, there will be no cortex. Yeah. Yes. So uh, any other question that you would like to ask Dr. Rafi before we proceed? Uh, to, uh, no, sir. Uh, I think we will move on to the cases that Dr. Hassan has has to show us. So, uh, Dr. Hassan, sir, can uh, uh, Dr. Shafi, can you stop sharing that so that Dr. Yes. Hassan can show his slide and excellent presentation. Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Sayed, we can see your uh, slides. Okay, are you able to hear me? Yeah, you're audible. Great. So, um, again, thank you again for this opportunity. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here virtually with you. It's always a great honor. Um, so, you know, when I, when I talk to residents um, uh, here in the U.S., um, you know, I, we always do things from a case standpoint. Um, and so I, I wanted to just present, uh, um, you know, at least one case that kind of highlights um, what Dr. Rafai had, had discussed just in terms of the uh, um, surgical uh, approaches to, to, to uh, tumors or to other types of pathologies uh, from an occipital and parietal approach. So this first case is, is of a 14 year old boy who um, presented to our emergency room with headaches and, and gait imbalance. Um, his headaches were morning headaches that woke him up. Um, otherwise, his history was non-contributory. And, you know, on physical exam, there, there was a non-focal examination. But, but because of this history and the worry from, from the mother, um, the ER ended up doing imaging studies. And so you can see here on the left side, there's a sagittal post-contrast image as well as an axial post-contrast image that, that demonstrates, um, you know, an increased ventricular size uh, concerning for hydrocephalus, as well as this large lesion uh, in the pineal area. Um, uh, it's a large heterogeneous lesion, um, sort of cystic as well. And so I bring up this case because of the, the topic in terms of approaches, either, um, you know, parietal or occipital approaches and approaches to the pineal region, um, sort of utilizing um, what has been discussed. Um, and so I wanted to give you this case example uh, and, and sort of my thought process in dealing with this. Um, it all, it'll also give us an opportunity to talk about pineal tumors as well and, and sort of uh, how to manage those. But, you know, in seeing, in seeing pineal tumors, you think about a couple of things. One, how do you treat the hydrocephalus? And that can be done in a number of ways. Again, there's no right or wrong way, but um, if, in, if it's an emergency situation, placing an EVD, otherwise treating the uh, hydrocephalus with an ETV or a shunt. The second thing in terms of uh, when you see a tumor is, well, we need tissue diagnosis and how can we do this? Um, certainly in the pediatric population, um, there are certain pathologies that can that need to be um, diagnosed um, um, and subsequently would require, you know, other types of treatment like chemotherapy, radiation, or an open uh, surgery. And so uh, to do this, one could do an ETV um, uh, plus a biopsy, uh, doing an ETV 
will obviously treat the hydrocephalus. And while you're there, you can do an endoscopic biopsy versus a, a stereotactic biopsy, which is a little uh, involved in terms of risk or an open surgery. And then obviously tumor control using um, uh, various methods, but also having surgery in your uh, armamentarian in terms of uh, taking care of the pathology. In this case, the patient was admitted and um, you know, we ended up doing serum labs. Um, anytime you see a pineal tuber, you wanna think along those lines, what are, what's the medical workup related to that? Um, so this child did have an elevated serum beta HCG and an AFP. Now, you know, all, all our uh, tumors are discussed in a multidisciplinary fashion. Um, you know, because of the elevated um, markers, one could argue that um, a, a tissue diagnosis isn't needed and, and you would treat this up front with chemotherapy to see how this would react. But because this child needed um, treatment for the hydrocephalus, we, we were gonna be there to do an ETV. And if, if, if it was felt safe, we would do a biopsy. So my plan was to do a, a right frontal burr hole for an ETV as well as an uh, endoscopic biopsy. And so that went well. Um, the pathology ended up being a germ cell tumor, uh, but like the yolk sac tumor. So the subsequent plan was to do um, uh, rounds of chemotherapy. However, you can see here one month, one month post-op and after two cycles of chemotherapy, this child's um, uh, tumor grew significantly, um, almost you know, tripled in size. Um, thankfully, his hydrocephalus was controlled. However, um, he was um, uh, in general getting weaker. And because this wasn't responding with chemotherapy, um, you know, the next step would be to start thinking about the approaches for, for, for surgery. And as uh, Dr. Rafai, uh, Rafai mentioned, you know, one of the approaches that, that I like personally is the occipital inner hemispheric approach. Um, and in this, in this case, um, going through the, the, the corpus callosum, the splenium, transplenial approach in order to remove this tumor. This approach, you know, works well when the tumor is more within the third ventricle as opposed to inferiorly as, as was mentioned, where other approaches could be uh, utilized in a more efficient manner. So in this case, you know, I did an occipital craniotomy, uh, interhemispheric approach in the prone position. Um, I also ended up placing an EVD just for brain relaxation to help as well. Um, you know, as was mentioned, um, it's important to, um, you know, when, when approaching that corridor and using the natural planes, there is an element of retraction that needs to be done. But, you know, obviously the occipital lobe is even more sensitive in terms of vision. Um, and so dynamic retra retraction, um, it, it, you know, if it's possible to use, um, to use that in order to give br the brain some, um, uh, uh, you know, essentially some space. And so um, that was done uh, with, and the surgery was done with neuro navigation as well as with neuro monitoring. And uh, eventually the, the pathology ended up being a teratoma and subsequently the, the patient was treated with chemotherapy and proton radiation. So this is a post contrast image. I wish I had uh, intraoperative pictures and um, a video, but I don't for this case, but you can see um, we, the, the, the corridor, the, the occipital inner hemisphere corridor is very nice. Um, and, and you can see we went through the splenium, resected the tumor, and thankfully postoperatively the child did well. Um, um, and so just a few slides in terms of advantages of uh, open resection using that corridor in terms of pineal tumor resection. You know, you can, as we talked about, you can get definitive diagnosis, potentially a curative for benign tumors, um, the resection curative for some non-benign tumors. Um, debulking can be beneficial for malignant tumors. There are definitely operative risks, um, you know, as was mentioned in terms of the deep veins and being very careful in terms of dissection of the tumor capsule. Uh, sometimes, you know, it is safer to leave some tumor behind if, if there is significant risk um, because uh, of, the, of the risks involved of, of venous injury. Um, and obviously uh, taking care of uh, the obstruction can, can uh, control the hydrocephalus as well. So just uh, briefly going through those surgical approaches, um, you know, we talked about already about the infratentor supracerebral approach. Um, you, we talked about the occipital transtentorial approach to, as well as the transcolosal approach. And when viewing, um, you, you know, uh, in terms of when deciding what approach to make, you know, you can go through um, in very complex way how to, to, um, to choose an approach, but I try to keep things simple. When I look at an image, 
I try to think of what's the shortest and safest way in order to get to that tumor. So for example, on this left side, we have this lesion. And so an occipital transitorial approach is, is probably the most direct way to get to this lesion, as opposed to the tumor in the middle, where um, you know you could argue a, an infratentorial supracerebral approach versus an occipital uh, interhemispheric uh, approach could be used. Um, uh, parietal, uh, you know, a transcosal approach can be used for tumors that are more anteriorly as well. Um, it's first described by Dandy, um, uh, but these can be associated with uh, significant morbidity as well in terms of uh, disconnection syndrome, depending on how much of the corpus callosum you, you do take. So. Um, uh, the supracerebellar infratentorial approach, um, you know, you can do the sitting versus prone. Um, um, I, I, I'm a fan of doing things, again, in a more simple way of doing things prone. However, um, the sitting approach does allow for retraction. Obviously, um, when, when you're doing um, cases sitting, you want to, um, you know, have a preoperative pre considerations in terms of um, risks involved, and that includes uh, air embolism that was discussed. And so, you know, it's important to think about, you know, whether or not uh, it's useful to place a central line, whether or not you should use precordial Dopplers. You know, when you think of um, um, air embolism and some of the findings um, that anesthesia um, and, and the surgeon uh, looks out for, these are important things to note, you know, not only in, when you're doing these surgeries, but also, you know, for, for, for your boards as, as, as trainees, you think about um, um, uh, the boards and exams to take as well. So, um, uh, as you know, as you guys uh, probably are aware, you know, the mill wheel murmur is, is specific for, for, for air embolism, something to note as well. But uh, um, this is a useful approach for um, to getting to the center of the tumor. It minimizes risk to the veins, um, and there's no violation of normal uh, tissue. Contrast that to the occipital interhemispheric approach. Um, again, as I was mentioning, this this works well with tumors extending superiorly, tumors that that abut the um, uh, corpus callosum or um, uh, uh, ones that go up to the tentorium. Um, uh, as well as um, tumors that displace the veins ventrally. Um, um, uh, as you can see from, from the tumor that, uh, that I resected in that example, large tumors can, can also be um, um, successfully approached using this uh, uh, technique um, and, uh, because it allows for a greater exposure. The uh, infratentorial supracellular approach, you know, Dr. Rafai uh, talked about the advantages and disadvantages, so I'll, I'll skip these slides. Um, the occipital interhemispheric approach, we talked about the incisions. This is sort of a hockey stick incision that, that, I, that I've used in the past. Now I, I, I tend to use more linear incisions or a small horseshoe incision that exposes both um, um, uh, sides, the left and right side. Whereas before I would do burr holes um, and only expose uh, the right side, I now um, find it uh, more helpful just in terms of retraction to, to uh, do a, crania a bilateral craniotomy. So I will place uh, two to three burr holes right at midline, dissect the, the, the dura off midline, and then do a craniotomy uh, encompassing both sides. I think uh, personally in my experience, it helps with retraction um, and getting in between um, uh, the occipital lobe um, and, and the inner hemispheric approach. Um, again, these are other intraoperative pictures of that, the, the craniotomy. Um, at midline, and then the C-shaped opening of the dura towards midline. Um, the transtentorial approach, um, again, was mentioned, but one of the pearls here is obviously try to identify the straight sinus or be lateral to midline when you're making this incision. Uh, sometimes um, this can bleed um, significantly, but um, you know one just has to be patient. We use bipolar electrocautery, and, and you can easily get um, uh, this um, uh, incised, and then um, a view the tumor or or, or other uh, anatomy of the veins uh, very easily. Um, this is a, a, a an example of a tumor that was resected uh, using the um, uh, um, occipital trans uh, tentorial approach because of the cyst. Um, you can see here in this middle picture. Um, actually, the anterior commissure and the columns, the fornix, as well as uh, the, the foramen of Monroe. Again, um, uh, a very good uh, approach. Uh, another example of an astrocytoma of the tectum um, that can be um, approached using the occipital uh, transtentorial approach. Um, again, note the 
note the location of the tumor that allows for this to be done in a, in a safe manner. Uh, and these are just intropic pictures, sort of demonstrating the tumor, resection of the tumor and the, and the deep venous structures. Again, all um, important in terms of um, um, the approach itself and, and dissection of the tumor. Um, this is another uh, example of, of a child who had a uh, pineal region tumor. As you can tell, uh, post contrast, it was sort of irregular in appearance. You can see the axial images here to, to the bottom right. Um, and so again, just in terms of the um, the, the the protocol, uh, you know, especially in pediatric patients, you know, we treat the hydrocephalus with the ETV, do CSF and serum uh, CSF cytology and serum and CSF tumor markers. In this case, they were all negative, um, so we ended up having to do a, an open craniotomy for uh, for a biopsy. Um, this was done using stealth um, again through an occipital, uh, interhemispheric, and then um, a transtentorial approach. Um, um, you can tell here, you know, had the bipolar pretty significantly because of the bleeding. But again, as soon as you, you cut into this, confirmed with narrow navigation, you're right at the abnormality. Uh, so it's really a straight um, approach um, and one that, um, you know, saves um, uh, brain injury um, in terms of the approach itself. And so just to orient yourself, this is midline, inferior, superior, lateral. Um, you know, there's a lot of brain relaxation done in terms of releasing CSF just from the inner hemisphere dissection, going down, seeing the tent um, uh, and opening it, opening it up in terms of getting the uh, abnormal uh, tumor and, and sending biopsy specimens. Um, just a, a slide for benefits of surgical resection of pineal tumors. Certainly um, for germinomas, these can be treated without an open surgery, but other types of tumors, if they are not responsive, um, uh, to, to other types of treatment, then open surgery is a good method. Um, and so th that's really, um, I wanted to stop there um, and, uh, you know, take any questions. Um, it's just one, one case I figured that I could, I could share in, in the amount of time we had. Um, and again, I want to thank you all for this opportunity and, and hope to be involved in the future as well. Thank you, Dr. Sayed, uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, if, if the participants have any question from Dr. Sayed, uh, he'll be happy to take it. You can write your questions in the chat box. Uh, so uh, I, I, I saw that you uh, used an EVD for a, uh, for a transcolosal approach. Uh, if you're not using EVD, do you use a lumbar drain? That's a great question. Um, so I typically uh, don't use lumbar drains. You know, I'll either if I feel like the brain is not tight, I'll, I'll just release CSF during the interhemispheric approach. Um, otherwise, I will place an EVD. Um, certainly, um, a lumbar drain could be possible. It just depends on, uh, you know, the hydrocephalus and whether there's a risk uh, involved with that. Uh, for other types of tumors, meningiomas and uh, other large tumors that are extra axial in location, I think certainly a lumbar drain is helpful. Um, I know that, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, Aaron cohen Gadal talks a lot about um, lumbar drains and, and CSF relaxation for his tumors. I think that that is one of the safest things to do, um, but it, it, it depends on the pathology. So there are, are there any other questions from Dr. Hassan? Uh, I think uh, there are no other questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan Sayed, for your presence, especially uh, at this uh, time at your part of the world. I think it's nearly midnight awesome. there. It, it, it's almost, yeah, almost. But yeah. but for 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 uh, participating in these, you know, it really means a lot for 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 me to to be involved, and and, okay. and I'm, I'm happy to help. Uh, so so uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, from Dr. Gibran Tarek, and he's saying, can you please explain the extent of uh, colostomies that we were able to perform uh, through an occipital approach, and how afraid are you of, with the disc, uh, with the possibility of a disconnection syndrome yeah. while you're doing? You know, that's a great question. And, and honestly, this is a question that I ask myself every case um, and ask, you know, those that are senior to me as well. You know, I find that, you know, typically when you read the books, when you, when you talk to people, uh, you know, people talk about one and a half to two centimeters. Um, to be, uh, if you look at the, the, the tumor that I did, it was probably more than two centimeters. I think that you can get away with doing more what's needed in terms of taking out the tumor, but certainly trying to do the least disruption possible 
I think in any approach is the most important thing. Um, and so it's really weighing the risks and benefits of things. You, uh, you know, I've all I've done cases where, for example, a central neurocytoma doing an inner hemispheric and in, you know anteriorly transcostal approach. And again, you read about doing things two centimeters, but but I think the people who have more and more experience with this, they they're able to do more and more, push the boundaries. Now that being said, I would do again as conservative as you can in order to get the job done. I think that's a, a good answer. And obviously, um, you know, it varies from patient to patient. And that's the question you, you are always asking yourself. Uh, uh, I think there's one more uh, uh, question. Uh, what's the fate of disconnection syndrome? Uh, uh, what's your experience with uh, seeing disconnection syndrome? Is it self-limiting? Does it recover? Yeah. So, so I think we have not seen in, in this approach specifically for pineal and doing a transplant approach, disconnection syndrome. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Rich Ellenbogen has um, a, a paper where he's done many, many of these uh, approaches, a transponial approach, um, and his rate of disconnection is extremely low. So, so I think in general, um, it, it, it's low. It's certainly theoretically possible, um, but, um, um, uh, you know, the patients do recover over time if it is seen. Uh, so, Dr. Mohammad Rafi is saying that what uh, important uh, factors you consider uh, by looking at the scan while choosing a transclosal approach is there something? Yeah. To... So, so, um, so sort of um, the main the main rule is again, where is the tumor? If it's more anterior and, and within the third ventricle, pineal third ventricle, I think a trans uh, spinal route is a great route. If it's more uh, posterior inferior. The, and, and then and then looking at the anatomy of the veins, the other approaches that you discussed, um, you know, uh, could be appropriate. But it, you know, in in the case that I showed, you could see it's a very large tumor, and a lot of it was in the pineal region, and then and then more forward or more anterior. And so that's why a more direct route through a trans uh, spinal route wa was used in that case. Um, so it kind of goes back to trying to simplify things, looking at the scans what's the best, easiest direct route to a tumor, and then determining whether it's safe, you know, in terms of the venous anatomy and other um, eloquent structures. So uh, uh, Dr. Tahir is asking that, uh, do, uh, ha, do you use a supra-infratentorial approach as well? And while you're using it, how do you, how do you decide whether to go uh, do it? You already mentioned the extent uh, of the tumor, but He's asking, uh, what, uh, how do you decide between a transcolosal approach versus a supra uh, tentorial uh, yeah. approach? Yeah. So it, you know, if the if the tumor is is sort of inferior and pushing towards a posterior fossa, um, then 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 I would um, um, use the infratentorial super cerebellar approach. Um, uh, you know, I haven't used a combined approach, but certainly, you know, if you, you know, that's an option as well. If you, if you try one approach and there's some left over, you can always go back um, and try a different approach as well. Um, um, so, um, you know, I hope that helps answer your question, but in my mind, in order to simplify things, it all depends on where the tumor is and what's the most direct approach to it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hasan Sayyid. Uh, we'd like to conclude our session. And I thank you again for joining us at this point in time, since it's already midnight there. Uh, 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 next week, we'll start with the anatomy of the ventricles. Uh, Dr. Ozair will uh, be the presenter. Uh, I thank you all for joining in. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hasan Sayyid. Thank you all. Take care. Very nice meeting you. Take care.